In part two of this series, I'll take you through the steps I took to paint and weather the Tamiya 48 scale Nas horn, and I promise to scale back on the gags. Are you kidding me? Maybe. G'day guys, I'm Clayton, and this is Workbench Hobbies. When we left off, the model was primed and ready for paint. The colour for the chipping had been applied to the fighting compartment and the gun breech during the previous steps and the areas were coated in two layers of chipping fluid. After about 10 minutes of dry time, these sections were painted in XF60 dark yellow. Some variation was created by selectively spraying a lightened mix of the dark yellow. Almost immediately after the parts are painted, the surfaces are moistened. They've been moistened! Thank you, Monty, with tap water. An old brush is used to start chipping the paint away. I first worked on the gun breech and then on some of those internal surfaces. By using different brushes, I'm able to create different chips. And a toothpick is also a handy tool in the arsenal and can be used to create a variety of chipping and scratches. When chipping the sections, always try and think of the logical areas where chipping would occur. My main focus was around the floor and the compartment that would have seen the most foot traffic. Adding chipping around the corners at the top edges of the doors is also a great way to tell a story of the vehicle and help suggest the motion of the parts. The details around the gun breech were brush painted using a fine brush and a mix of acrylics. All of this pre-painting was really just a matter of access and I had to take my opportunity whilst I had it. The parts then received a light enamel wash using AK Brown for dark yellow vehicles. And once the wash was dry, the excess was removed using a makeup sponge. Finer details were added to the handles and the seat using a graphite pencil. And just by highlighting the edges, I'm able to create a realistic, worn, metallic look to the parts. To finish off the section, a light dry brush using pale sand acrylic was applied. The secret to the dry brush layer is less is more. Remove as much paint from your brush as you can and lightly apply it over the part. The effect should be almost impossible to detect and should be built up slowly. The effect is it helps visually elevate and raise the detail around the assembly and when used in combination with the enamel washers it adds great depth and detail to the parts. With the bulk of the painting complete for the interior sections I can now move on to the exterior surfaces. I carefully applied the next layer of paint to the model and I wasn't too fussed about overspray so I didn't bother masking up the internal areas. The initial coat was dark yellow, thin to about 50-50 mix or thereabouts, with retarder thinner, and sprayed over the model in a couple of light coats. The base colour was then lightened using white and spraying in a random fashion to the horizontal surfaces as well as the top and leading edges around the model. By varying the tone in the base colour, I'm able to create a bigger visual volume to the model and help it look less like a toy. That is not a toy. With the foundation colours down, the rest of the fighting compartment received a quick targeted enamel wash with the brown for yellow wash. 
I'm always conscious when painting German three-tone schemes that often the dark green can look overly heavy when painting in scale. It's for that reason I'll be using NATO green for the green sections and red brown for the limited patches through the scheme. I had no reference other than the historical photograph I was working from so this application was always going to be an interpretation and freehand applied. The pressure on the compressor was dropped to about 12 psi and the NATO green was thinned to about a 50-50 paint thinner mix ratio. This is the moment where the painting begins and a bit of a leap of faith and it's just a matter of trusting yourself and seeing it through. I'm getting more overspray than I was happy with so I probably should have stopped and thinned my paint a little further and backed off the pressure but I know I'm probably going to want to do a little bit of tidy up later so I pressed on with the application. To clean up the overspray a thin mix of the dark yellow was used just to fill in the gaps and tidy it up. The red brown sections of the scheme are now applied and I went with the scheme being predominantly green on yellow with a minimal amount of the red brown just for some variation. Some additional variation was added to the green sections using a mix of NATO brown and green yellow however there was a technical issue with the recording so you'll just have to take my word for it. As chance would have it, I was lucky enough that the division markings could be used from the kit supplied decal sheet with a little modification. The decals were removed from the backing sheet, submerged in the water for about a minute and then applied in place according to the reference image. Some basic detail painting around the vehicle was now done using acrylics and a fine brush. I kind of wished I'd painted the jack whilst off the model because access was a little awkward. The spare tracks were painted in black brown. In hindsight, I wish I'd have modified this part and removed some of the spare tracks as a point of difference, but it was a little late now, so it was just time to move along. Oh, so many regrets. It's always a good idea to seal the decals with a clear coat, but I also used this stage to add a very light filter to the model. The semi-gloss clear has a touch of dark yellow mixed in with it and once sprayed the colour will tend to unify the paintwork and tie it all together. The downside of the semi-gloss and gloss wood also for that matter will have is that it will make the paintwork appear darker. The upside is once I apply the matte finish in subsequent layers the paint should lighten up again. Another trick in the kit bag to age and weather these three-tone schemes is the oil dot rendering technique. The effect is achieved by first placing small dots of oil paint across the section. As a general rule, the lighter colours will be through the higher edges and the darker colours towards the bottom. I've used white, buff, shadow brown at this stage. However, I did introduce a small amount of blue as well. A flat brush is dipped in white spirit and the majority of that fluid is removed on a paper towel and then by working the brush in an up and down motion the oil paint will be distributed across the part. Essentially this is just another filter being applied over the piece however the different colours will produce an interesting tonal effect. Yes, it's time for a wash and for this stage I'm using a combination of mid-tone brown and a darker brown enamel wash. These washes are thinned enamel paint and can be used straight from the bottle. However, I do often thin them a little with the enamel thinner before using them. The pin wash is applied through the recesses and around rivets and it will help visually lift these details off the model. It's inevitable that the wash will need some cleanup, and in most cases that is as easy as rubbing the sections with a makeup sponge. This is done as soon as the paint is touch dry and if you happen to miss that window the paint can be reactivated with a small amount of white spirit or enamel thinner and cleaned up that way. 
I remember back in the early days of my modeling journey, uh, always being fascinated with the airbrush, but also being a little intimidated by it. So now using the airbrush is my favorite thing to do in the hobby. So I do tend to use it whenever the excuse arises. By using a heavily thin mix of red, brown and black, thinned with isopropyl alcohol as my thinning medium, I apply a post shade layer. The paint is thin to around 90% isopropyl alcohol and 10% paint. The shading focuses around recessed areas, around rivets and things like that. And painting these disruptive schemes can often strip away the shape, the visual shape of the model. I guess that's the whole point of camouflage, right? At the end of the day. However, by applying this shading effects, it will be subtle, but it will help add some shape back to the model. With the thinned mix of this paint still in the airbrush, I'm able to achieve some additional vertical streaking just by running the airbrush in a downward motion across the part. The effect is subtle, but it just adds that extra layer. Time for some chipping and by picking away at an old piece of sea sponge and then selectively dabbing the paint around the model, I'm able to create some chipping, focusing on the areas that would have seen the highest wear on the real vehicle. Remember, less is more, and this should be a thoughtful process and carefully planned rather than having your model look like it has the plague. Further scratches and chipping are added around the model using a fine brush. I'm trying to simulate some more of the damage to the paintwork on the front armour plate as this is where the tow cable would usually be stored. Interesting effects can also be achieved by applying long horizontal scratches. This will give the impression that the vehicle has scraped past something and has been damaged along the way. I never really got my head around these weathering pencils, but this buffed pencil is a quick and simple way to add some superficial scuffs along the side of the vehicle. As long as you keep the tip of the pencil sharp and move it in a structured way, the scratches and scuffs look quite reasonable. Is dry brushing dead? I don't think so, but it isn't a technique I use a lot. I thought I'd give it a go here because as mentioned earlier, the three tone camos can tend to visually flatten the model. I'm using a dedicated brush for this technique and by removing as much of the paint as I can off the brush before starting and then gently running the bristles over the part, I'm able to have the light paint catch the raised details of some of the edges around the model and this will help highlight them and bring them to life and lift them off that three-tone camo. Focus is now back to the running gear and tracks and looking to integrate the mud and debris in with the top side of the model. I head back to the dark mud terrains paste at this point and begin applying it around the lower edges of the model. It's a recurring theme, but remember to apply logic to the places you are building up the mud. Think about the movement of the tracks and the function of the parts and let that help you guide the places that you're putting the mud. Because the paste is water-based, uh, I have a small window that I'm able to feather the edges and create some interesting effects here with it. Here I'm using a sponge moistened with water just to redistribute the paste and feather the edges a little more. The seagrass clippings and a small amount of non-trademark soil from my garden was scattered around the front guards. The distribution was carefully refined with a soft brush and once I was happy, the scatter was set in place using sand and gravel fixer from AK.
In order to integrate the effect around the entire model, the seagrass clippings are now attached to the front section and the spare tracks. Once everything had around 24 hours to dry, the model received an all over matte varnish using VMS XXL matte. This would help unify all the different gloss levels that were starting to appear as well as act as another layer to seal in the previous weathering steps. I'm now back to using the buff and the flat earth dust mix to add another layer of dust to the lower edges of the model. And it might seem like a lot of back and forth, but successful weathering is all about building up your layers and constantly refining the finish. A mix of earth tone pigments is now stippled around the model and focus is on the horizontal sections of the track guards to begin with. And once in place, the dry pigments receive a drop of white spirit to help settle them in place. The pigment mix is then applied around the underside of the hull and around the wheels and tracks. I wasn't satisfied with the level of earthy buildup in these areas when I compared it against the reference photo, so it was my hope that the pigment mix would help address that. The area was then flooded with the white spirit and left to dry. After these sections had time to dry, I was able to manipulate the pigment mix somewhat using the makeup sponge. This will help tidy up the effect around sections like the rubber on the road wheels. Splattering effects are a quick and easy way to help present your scale model as appearing larger than it actually is. And by adding a small amount of the enamel paint to a flat brush and running an airbrush needle across the bristles, I'm able to create a whole lot of small speckles or splatters. I first used the lighter colour working in logical areas around the model. I then moved to the darker tone paint and repeat the process, only this time the coverage is a little less than the lighter colour that was just applied. As a general rule, the lighter tones should have a greater coverage and the darker tones less of a coverage, and by layering the mud deposits, you can help tell the story of the vehicle. Because the splattering is such a messy process, some removal is inevitable. A brush with white spirit is used to remove any unwanted spots and refine the effect. Now back to the dark brown enamel paint and to help represent wet tones in the mud, a selective wash is applied to some of the wheels and some of the recesses around the model. Constant back and forth, I know, but weathering armour is a process of constant correction. Selective streaking is now added to the model using an enamel rust effects from ammo, and a fine brush is used to apply a small amount of the product in a few details around the model and by first painting the streak in a downward motion and then gently blending it with a brush with a touch of white spirit I'm able to create another interesting layer to the weathering. Engine grease oil paint is fast becoming one of my favourite parts of the weathering process and this paint has a different consistency to other oils and is a lot more fluid than the traditional oil paint and it will dry with a high gloss finish and it's applied focusing on selected wheels and running gear and will simulate grease around these sections. It's also worked in and around some of the recesses where the pigment effects were applied to the horizontal track guards in the earlier stages and this extra layer of oil paint in these sections will give the illusion that the mud built up is wet and yet another way to add further interest to the finish. And by thinning the oil paint with the white spirit again I'm able to create all types of oil and grease staining around the model. 
These open top vehicles usually carry tarps and covers that could be strung over the top of the vehicle to give the crew some shelter from the elements. Whilst this is an out of box build, you are allowed to use putty and fillers, so I thought I'd try my luck and add a tarp. The tarp was sculpted using a two part putty. I'm using a product from Green Stuff, and two equal parts are combined in a twisting motion. You know the parts have been combined well when the colour becomes a uniform green. Talcum powder is placed on a plate and the putty is rolled out to start the process. I then use my fingers in a circular motion to flatten the sheet and by using my fingers I get a feel for how thick the sheet is and I'm able to expand it and work it out into a consistent thickness. The edges of a steel rule are then used to cut the mass into a small rectangular section. Excess talc is removed with a dry brush and then the putty is fitted into the rear of the fighting compartment. A soft brush with water is used to help manipulate the section and set it in place. I'll give it a coat of paint once dry, but essentially that sees the end of the build. So there it is, my out of the box Almost. 48 scale Tamiya Nashorn. There's no doubting that 35th scale will always be my passion, but the ease of construction and manageable size of these subjects, as well as the ever expanding range really makes a strong case for this scale moving forward. The smaller scale naturally means there has to be some sacrifice with detail when compared with larger scales, but I think there is a good compromise, at least with these Tamiya kits. They are great for the beginner and of course anyone looking to expand their skills and expose themselves to something new. Painting and weathering a three-tone scheme can be challenging for a number of reasons. Firstly, there is the skill required to freehand the scheme and keep your overspray to a minimum. Then there is the effect that the weathering layers have on the depth and definition of the scheme. It has a constant back and forth trying to achieve that sweet spot in the finish. I did have my battles with that during this build, however, I feel I finally got to a point I was happy with. As I edit this video, I am literally teetering on the edge of what I should do next. I was thinking about a vignette for this model, but I feel like that keeps moving me away from the outer box concept, which was the foundation of this build. That plus the fact I find the whole idea of doing a vignette a little intimidating. Maybe that's the reason I should be doing it. I may be better sinking my teeth into something new, but let me know what you guys think in the comments below. What would you like to see? Would you prefer me to focus on the builds or look to venture into the landscape bases? What about the subjects? Stick with armor or should I delve into the dark arts of aircraft modeling? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you for allowing me on your screens. I do not take it for granted. And remember, this is the greatest hobby in the world and has so much to offer. We're all in this together, so share it with your friends and connect with your community. Most of all, be kind to yourself and be kind to each other, and let's enjoy this journey together. I'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. Thanks for watching.